section one of the english restoration and louis the fourteenth from the peace of westphalia to the peace of nijmegen this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by pamela nagami the english restoration and louis the fourteenth from the peace of westphalia to the peace of nijmegen by osmond airy preface the epoch of european history with which i have here attempted to deal is an epoch of restorations restorations which assume widely different forms in correspondence with the varying circumstances of the countries in which they take place in france after a period of fierce internal strife during which all antagonistic influences exhaust themselves in a vain struggle with the tenacious purpose of mazarin and sink into helplessness the triumphant monarchy emerges as a despotism of an almost oriental type that despotism is conferred upon a prince of great capacity and of boundless ambition with all the instruments of ambition ready to his hand in england a different scene is witnessed the revolution had overthrown three great institutions the monarchy the parliament and the church all three were now restored under the old forms the parliament first and then in natural sequence the monarchy and the church and when the settlement is complete it is seen that the first and the last have gained immensely and that what they have gained the crown has lost acting in strict harmony the parliament and the church assume toward the king a dictatorial attitude and from their dictation he partially escapes by a gradually deepening subservience to louis the fourteenth a subservience rendered easy from the fact that parliament has as yet no direct control upon foreign policy the union of the two monarchs leads to a third restoration that of william of orange by the combined attack of france and england the united provinces are brought to the brink of destruction they escape from the peril by throwing off a constitution ill adapted for confronting immediate national peril and by placing once more the executive power though with many limitations in the hands of a single man the representative of the house under whom independence had been won the treatment of this period in a form as condensed as is required by the plan of the series has been rendered difficult by two facts it is in the first place a period of incessant diplomatic intrigue on the part of every ruler concerned and all diplomacy is secret and personal and thus while avoidance of detail is a prime object details of which many seem not merely important but essential to a clear understanding of the story press in on every side to an extent scarcely to be appreciated by any one who has not somewhat attentively considered the subject there is secondly the fact that in england at least there are no great figures around whom interest and sympathies may gather no prominent politician acts from a great motive no one after the fall of clarendon even from an honest or unselfish motive and no one seems to live in the open light of day there is no great cause definitely present to men's minds to strengthen the moral fibre wearied with the tension of twenty years the parliament is possessed by vague wants and vaguer terrors it displays a low moral sense and is ruled by a spirit of unreason though by the very law of its being it half consciously feels its way toward the goal of sixteen eighty nine the character and purposes of the king his detestable private example the influence of his mistresses the potency of backstairs intrigue afford the opportunity for all who unite ambition and capacity with cunning frivolity or shamelessness to come to the front and to prosper in writing the chapters devoted to the fronde i have drawn largely from the histoire de france pendant la minorité de louis xiv and the histoire de france sous le ministère de mazarin of m cheroul which from the impartial and exhaustive use displayed by the writer of authorities previously unknown or neglected must be held to supersede former works on the subject 
the voluminousness however the abundance of detail and the somewhat provoking looseness of the arrangement of these volumes render the conception of persons and events in their due proportions a matter of the utmost difficulty the histoire de france of m henri martin and especially the franceuse geschichte of professor ronca have been constantly referred to to lessen this difficulty while in one or two instances i have been aided by dr kitchen's history of france and mr perkins france under richelieu and mazarin for the part played by louis the fourteenth outside france during the years between sixteen sixty and sixteen seventy eight i have relied principally upon m minier's negotiation relative a la succession d'espagne supplemented on all questions regarding the connection between louis the fourteenth and charles the second by ronca's history of england principally in the seventeenth century while with respect to the dutch republic my chief authority has been the jan de witt of m pontali macgregor's holland and the dutch colonies has also been found useful in enabling me to give a brief description of the commercial supremacy of the dutch the parliamentary debates as recorded in volume four of the parliamentary history have of course been indispensable in questions of home politics while a few facts of interest and importance are drawn from the inspection of original documents such as the essex and sheldon papers which have not yet been printed the plan of the series does not admit of reference to authorities this requires mention as not only the statements but possibly here and there the actual phrases of the writers who have been consulted may be noticed i regret that the assigned limits have forbidden the introduction of an account of scotland during the period or of the remarkable scope and activity of english commercial enterprises in conclusion i wish to acknowledge two personal obligations to mr s r gardiner who in the midst of his own labours has found time now and continuously during several years to give advice and ungrudging assistance to one who is but a novice in the craft of which he is a master and to my friend mr w l sargent who has aided me with the revision of the proof sheets throughout the book osmondary birmingham october second eighteen eighty eight end of section one Section two of the English Restoration and Louis the Fourteenth by Osmond Airy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter one Peace of Westphalia. One General Effect. The Peace of Westphalia, october twenty eighth, sixteen forty eight, which closed the desolating struggle of the Thirty Years' War, ushered in a new phase of European history with the exception of russia poland and turkey not yet to be regarded as european nations and of england absorbed in her own internal settlement there was not a country in europe which did not henceforth work under new conditions the political map was designed afresh the old names indeed were retained but new conceptions were associated with them france germany the empire spain and the countries of the north meant from this moment something profoundly different both individually and relatively from what they had previously meant the power of the austrian house was worn out the spanish branch had lost its old influence in italy its armies had been shattered at roquoi and nordlingen it had been compelled through sheer weakness to abandon the struggle with the united provinces and it was hampered by domestic troubles while the german branch territorially and politically dissociated from the spanish had now to relax completely her failing grasp upon the princes of the empire and the free towns sweden had become dominant in the north but without a preponderance so great as to render her a danger to european peace france was for the time more than satisfied with the position in which she was left by the treaties and was regarded by the secondary states not as a menace but as a guarantee of their independence it was still more important that ideas which had in the past generally ruled the relations of peoples were ostensibly abandoned and a new groundwork of international policy was accepted with universal consent 
hitherto community of religion had been the recognized basis upon which alliances had been made and wars waged but the thirty years war is the last war of religion in europe the peace of westphalia did for european repose what henry of navarre had done for french unity waves of religious emotion indeed did afterwards from time to time momentarily influence a country's policy but only as incidental adjuncts to secular considerations for the first time in the history of christendom the wishes and decrees of the head of the catholic church were openly ignored in vain the papal nuncio strove to maintain the influence of rome in vain he protested in her name against the attacks which by the toleration of heretics and the secularization of ecclesiastical property were dealt to the church and in vain when the treaties were concluded and had become the law of europe the holy see declared them null invalid disavowed without force and without effect the thunders of rome fell upon unheeding ears the ecclesiastical idea had been replaced by a policy which boldly declared its national and secular origin henceforward it is the independence of individual states or to use a phrase as old as the reign of elizabeth the balance of power which becomes the ruling principle of international life two germany for germany three things were done in the first place there was granted an amnesty partial indeed within the hereditary domains of the emperor but complete and comprehensive over the rest of the empire this amnesty was no mere pardoning of political offences on the one side or the other but an absolute re-establishment of those who had been dispossessed of their territories during the war the religious difficulty was overcome by a compromise based on the peace of augsburg in fifteen fifty five between the rival faiths and between the rival branches of protestantism all questions of ecclesiastical property were determined by actual possession in sixteen twenty four that year being chosen as lying between sixteen eighteen the year when the thirty years war began and sixteen twenty seven when catholicism was again in the ascendant while a reconstitution of the extraordinary commissions of the diet with equal representation of catholics and protestants provided for the settlement of all future disputes finally the relations of the emperor to the states of the empire were so revised as to modify profoundly the political constitution under ferdinand the second and ferdinand the third the increasing power of the austrian house had gone far to stifle the independence of the princes of the empire and this independence they now recovered at the very base of the new settlement lay the condition that henceforth the free consent of the states of the empire assembled in diet should be necessary for all action on the part of the empire as a whole still more important was it that each state now secured the right of making foreign alliances so long as these were not directed against the emperor the empire the public peace or the treaty itself this was the work of french diplomacy mazarin took care to do in germany the reverse of what he was bent upon doing in france there we shall see him ready to sacrifice all to render the central power supreme over every form of independent and local action at home his aim was to weaken the central power to the utmost he followed the steps of richelieu in crushing the feudal idea in france he replaced and supported it in germany his object was that when occasion should arise it might be easy to create among these independent princes leagues which should paralyze the emperor's power of offensive action against france whilst they opened the way for her arms to the heart of the spanish low countries three france treaties of peace usually betoken a step in the rise or fall of nations for the power of the austrian house the peace of westphalia was a striking mark of decline for france it was the visible completion of a great bound to european supremacy it was emphatically a french triumph and as her efforts had been great 
so for her patronage of the new germanic federation france reaped a rich reward she was enabled at length to relinquish victoriously one part of her life and death struggle with the house of austria while by the condition that the emperor and empire were not to interfere in the war still to be fought out with spain she was set free to continue and to bring to a glorious termination twelve years later a conflict which had lasted with varying fortune since the time of francis i the defenceless position of paris within but a few days march of an enemy's fortresses had ever been a source of anxiety to french statesmen to make her strategically as she was historically the heart of france was the principal aim of their diplomacy that aim was now in a great measure realized by the cession of upper and lower alsace with zundgau and the prefectures of ten imperial towns france gained the coveted rhine frontier by the possession of old breisach and the right of placing a garrison in philipsburg she secured two advanced posts in germany while the stipulation that between basel and philipsburg no fortress might be established on the right bank of the river several existing strongholds being dismantled placed the whole of the upper rhine with the exception of strasbourg and places belonging to immediate vassals of the empire unreservedly in her hands at the same time commerce and navigation were made free throughout its course thus while austria was no longer able to join hands with spain in the netherlands inasmuch as the intervening states were now independent and the emperor could not march through them without their leave france had secured a riverway into the heart of the united provinces the whole rhine valley indeed was at her mercy for the great ecclesiastical electorates of treves and mayence were in her interest she obtained moreover the full recognition of her rights to the bishoprics of metz toul and verdun with their districts a right which she had claimed and practically exercised since their conquest by henry the second and she thereby secured a new and easy road avoiding the strong fortress of stenay to the frontier of the spanish low countries lastly the undisputed possession of pinerolo which she had acquired in sixteen thirty two opened to her a path through the passes of the alps into piedmont by all these acquisitions france had placed herself beyond the possibility of a sudden attack on her eastern frontier for the full accomplishment however of her ambition she had to wait to the northeast lay the spanish low countries with their line of well-nigh impregnable fortresses for securing them or at least for neutralizing the danger which they threatened every french minister had his scheme richelieu had proposed to form of them a free state mazarin desired to conquer them the dutch proposed to divide them with france it will be seen that in this direction the ambition of france was for a time frustrated that though a great step was made at the peace of the pyrenees in sixteen fifty nine the spanish low countries were to form the object of thirty years more of intrigue and war for sweden sweden supported by france made good her claim to a heavy share in the spoils of victory she obtained the whole of nearer and part of further pomerania with the reversion of the rest on the extinction of the male branch of the brandenburg house she thus secured the towns of stetten gatz dam and golnau with the islands of rügen and wollen which gave her complete command of the mouths of the oder on both banks while the cession of the town and harbour of wismar the archbishopric of bremen and the bishopric of verden placed in her power the navigation of the elba all these she held as immediate fiefs of the empire and thus claimed for bremen verden and pomerania three voices in the imperial diet she was also allowed to erect a sovereign court at wismar with a university at greifswald she had thus assured to her a communication with the scandinavian states and her dominion of the baltic and not only was placed in a position of marked though not crushing supremacy in the north of europe but gained a distinct hold upon germany both territorially and consultatively which lasted until the treaty of stockholm in seventeen twenty 
5. Spain. From all participation in that part of the Peace of Westphalia which concerned France and the Emperor, Spain was rigorously excluded. Exhausted and bankrupt from the war with France and the struggle with the Dutch, she had long been anxious for peace. But the terms demanded by Mazarin in 1646 had been too much for her pride. That minister was bent upon wresting from her the barrier of fortresses which made French safety or extension to the northeast impossible. For this purpose, he proposed to exchange the Spanish Low Countries for Catalonia and Roussillon, then in the possession of France. But Spain hoped, in view of the confusion caused in France by the civil troubles, then nearly at their height, to regain Catalonia and Roussillon by force of arms the spanish netherlands she determined to save in another way she resolved to bow to necessity and to close her long and profitless struggle with her rebellious subjects the dutch on their side were at the time not unwilling to dissolve their long-standing alliance with france they were alarmed at her rising power and at the prospect of a french army in occupation of the spanish low countries which at present formed a barrier between themselves and french ambition spain sedulously fostered this feeling and on january thirtieth sixteen forty eight concluded a treaty at munster whereby she at last acknowledged the complete independence of the united provinces she ceded to them all the places in brabant flanders and limburg of which they were then in possession afterwards known as the generality and she even granted liberty of conscience to all dutch subjects in her territory lastly she consented to close the navigation of the scheldt and adjoining waterways and so to ruin antwerp her great commercial centre for the benefit of its dutch rival amsterdam germany reconstituted upon a decentralization basis under the protection of france which now became the foremost european power the supremacy of austria in central europe destroyed sweden in a position of commanding strength in the north the spanish monarchy severed from austria and left face to face with france switzerland formally detached from the empire the united provinces a new and independent kingdom such is a rough political map of europe after the peace of westphalia End of section two Section three of the English Restoration and Louis the Fourteenth by Osmond Airy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter two Prelude to the Fronde, Part one. One Richelieu and Privilege, the Prime Ministership. Upon turning our eyes from the external grandeur of France to her internal condition, we behold a strange contrast it well illustrates the tenacity of purpose which was the leading characteristic of mazarin that even while the last formalities of the treaty which made france the arbiter of europe were taking place he with the youthful king and the queen mother were voluntary exiles from the seat of government so completely occupied indeed were the minds of all but the minister himself and a few of his fellow workers with the beginnings of civil discord that this great settlement passed almost without remark to ninety-nine out of every hundred frenchmen the treaty between the crown and the malcontents of paris under cover of which the court returned to the capital was of infinitely greater interest than the treaty of westphalia which was signed on the same day and which expressed the change which had passed over the face of europe to realize the meaning of the disturbances which under the name of the fronde went far during five years to render france powerless to take advantage of the position she had just gained it will be necessary to refer somewhat in detail to the principle which had consistently guided the policy of richelieu and his pupil mazarin this principle was by all means and at all costs to render the crown supreme over every rival influence henry the fourth had understood that what france needed was national unity richelieu had felt that the first condition of national unity 
was the unquestioned and unlimited authority of the central power his whole career was one unfaltering struggle with the spirit of privilege he determined to turn the great feudal dignitaries into courtiers the parliaments into mere courts of registration of the royal will beneath the kingship all ranks of society were to occupy one common level of subservience from the king was to issue all national activity in him was to centre all national aspirations his earliest and most critical struggle was against the governors of provinces these grandees had during the wars of religion well nigh shaken off even the semblance of submission to the royal authority they raised troops levied taxes administered justice made war or alliances and were in every respect independent sovereigns of their provinces they had even learned to regard their governments as hereditary rights they thus formed a barrier to all attempts at centralization richelieu therefore endeavoured to make their functions purely military and to render the governorship as costly and as powerless as possible every opportunity was taken to replace the governors whom he found in office in sixteen twenty four by men devoted to himself exile the prison and the scaffold were ruthlessly used by their readiness to engage in plots against him they played into his hands of the nineteen governors whom he found in sixteen twenty four four only remained at his death the other fifteen posts had been filled by men devoted to his interests or had been absorbed into the monarchy a still more effective blow against the genius of feudalism was the revival of the institution of intendants these officers chosen from the bourgeoisie nominated and dismissed at will by the king were devoted to the power to which they owed their existence and it was specially laid down that they might not be the relatives or dependents of the governors their power was immense extending at first only to matters of justice and police but before long to finance administration and every department of government by sixteen forty eight there were thirty-five of these officers with fixed posts in all the provinces who grasping little by little the whole provincial administration and guided and supported by the central authority in their resistance to the governors and all local bodies were the essential machinery of the central system as such they were always the first object of attack at the hands of the classes whose privileges they had destroyed richelieu's task was an easy one in dealing with the general body of the noblesse he had indeed no intention of destroying their privileges equality before the king was his main object and he judged that the surest way to secure that equality was a separation of classes so decided that union was an impossibility the fifth chapter of his testament politique is thus headed combien il est important que les diverses parties de l'état demeurent chacune dans l'entendu de ses bornes he therefore did all in his power to confirm them as a superior caste while as the means of sustaining their position he gave them the exclusive right to almost all offices of dignity and emolument and allowed them to engage in commercial undertakings without derogation to their rank but he had no intention of permitting them to remain a political power the conspiracies which they raised against him were nipped in the bud and their leaders coldly and inexorably put to death while the executions of de bouteville and des chapelles who had insolently defied the edict against duelling taught their whole body that the king's commands might not be lightly disobeyed the blow however which strikes the imagination most was one which marks in a vivid manner how great a space of time separated the political and social conditions of england and france the france of richelieu is the england of henry the second by the ordinance of july thirty first sixteen twenty six 
it was commanded that throughout the kingdom the fortifications of all towns and castles not needed for the defence of the frontiers should be destroyed as in england these castles were the haunts of oppression and formed the greatest burden of the peasant class accordingly an immense outburst of joy rose from the common people first throughout brittany and then throughout france since the days of louis the fat the monarchy had struck no greater blow for national unity against feudal oppression and anarchy all that remained of feudalism was stabbed to the heart richelieu's dealings with the church were conceived with the same view whilst he vehemently upheld the gallican liberties as the concrete expression of national life against the papal claims he was equally determined to allow no such independence in regard to the crown more than once he attacked in detail all the clerical immunities from taxation and compelled holders of benefices to recognize the full lordship of the king while on several occasions ordinances of a sweeping nature were issued without consultation with rome for the reform of both the regular and secular clergy new and frequent restrictions were also applied to ecclesiastical jurisdiction and the civil power intervened in many matters hitherto considered to be purely religious in their nature the local governing bodies had by the time of richelieu ceased in a great degree to possess political power and the cardinal faithful to his policy of balancing class against class had no desire to compass their further degradation occasionally however they formed centres of disturbance and they were then put down with a high hand thus troyes dijon and many other towns suffered the loss of part of their liberties while at la rochelle where in sixteen twenty eight the protestant schism in its political aspect was finally destroyed the municipal institutions were completely remodelled privas uze nimes anduze and montauban suffered the same treatment in sixteen twenty nine the revolt through sheer distress of the crocon in guienne in sixteen thirty seven and of the nupier in normandy in sixteen thirty nine led to a general annulling of privileges in these two provinces the jealousy of richelieu was still keener with regard to assemblies of a wider scope such as the etats generaux and the etats provinciaux the former indeed which corresponded with our english parliament were never summoned throughout his career while the latter which after sixteen twenty six were the only political bodies remaining with the right of approaching the sovereign were diligently suppressed the absence of any union or real legislative power among them rendered his task easy and at his death burgundy and languedoc were the only two provinces where the etats provinciaux retained so much as their old constitution with the parlement of the provinces and especially with the parlement of paris the conflict was more severe and prolonged originally this latter body was merely a part of the royal council charged with the administration of justice and with the duty of recording the decisions of the council itself it was also allowed the right called the droit de remonstrance of making observations upon these decisions from this right in the middle of the fifteenth century had sprung the claim to refuse to record the edicts unless their remonstrances were acted upon at the same period the members acquired fixity of tenure of their offices and a little later hereditary right the parlement of paris naturally became the incarnation of privilege in its most selfish and aggressive form taking advantage of every moment of weakness on the part of the central authority it had grown in strength until it had assumed the right of direct intervention in state affairs and of representing the etats generaux when that body was not sitting to richelieu this pretended sovereignty formed a permanent obstacle to the national welfare and he determined to crush it the struggle lasted without cessation for fourteen years in vain richelieu endeavoured by menaces 
by creations of new offices by the exile and imprisonment of leading members to bend the parlement to his will so incessant and so galling was its opposition especially in the refusals to register the financial edicts rendered necessary by the enormous expenses of the war that in sixteen forty one he determined on a decisive step in his famous manifesto of that year he set forth the principles upon which alone the state could prosper the complete equality and entire submission of all men before the king is the first condition for national grandeur and stability whensoever this had been lost sight of as in the evil days of henry the third misfortune had followed the royal authority was now again threatened by the exorbitant claims of the parlement they were thereupon forbidden in the most express terms to take henceforward any cognizance whatever of state affairs whilst allowing the ancient droit de remonstrance the declaration insisted upon the immediate registration of all edicts and declarations put forth from a lit de justice or formal sitting of the king in parlement whether these remonstrances were attended to or not the application moreover of this right was confined to matters of pure finance in all questions of state administration the edicts were to be published and registered without any deliberation whatsoever and to emphasize the determination of the court the offices of several members who had been forward in resistance were suppressed by the king de notre certaine science pleine de puissance et d'autorité royale from this moment the parlement ceased to be constitutionally a political assembly we shall indeed see it during the disturbances which followed the great cardinal's death raising itself for a few years only to sink into a dependence upon the central authority still more complete than before it is probable that the events which were passing in england contributed to this decisive action of richelieu in any case it is an interesting commentary upon the relative positions of the crown and its subjects in the two countries that during the months of imprisonment of strafford and laud and less than three months before the execution of the prime minister of charles by the english representative parliament the prime minister of louis was able by an act of masterful despotism to reduce to the position of a mere court of record of the royal will a turbulent and dangerous body of hereditary magistrates who had nothing in common with an english parliament but the name thus then before he died richelieu had altered the whole face of government every element of local or corporate resistance had well-nigh disappeared or existed only in name he left two ideas occupying the whole field the old idea of the absolute monarchy and the new idea which he created in france and which mazarin after a hard struggle sustained of the irresponsible prime ministership it was in the fact that to louis the fourteenth at the death of mazarin there descended both of these the prestige and power of royalty and the prestige and power of the premiership that his extraordinary position was in a great degree owing and it was the struggle the selfish and frivolous struggle of the privileged classes against the new creation and not against the monarchy that constituted the fronde two mazarin and the reaction the absolutism established by richelieu had lasted too short a time to crush out of his opponents the memory of their former influence the instincts of privilege were awake and vigilant and their opportunity speedily came louis the thirteenth died but a few months after his great minister he had faithfully carried out richelieu's policy but even during those months the iron rule had been relaxed so far as to awaken the hope of a great reaction the state prisoners were released the parlement began at once to reclaim and to exercise that interference in state affairs off which richelieu had so haughtily warned them the banished members returned to paris and the suppressed offices were re-established a declaration issued by louis had imposed upon the queen at his death a council by which her regency would be entirely controlled 
and this declaration had been registered by the parlement on the following day without resistance only four days after the king's death however the parlement by way of asserting its authority abolished this council on the ground that such a limitation of the regent's functions was contrary to the principles of the french monarchy and placed the whole power unreservedly in the queen's hands both richelieu and the parlement had deceived themselves the cardinal to whom the queen had naturally enough been a lifelong enemy and who expected that her first wish would be to make peace with the house of austria of which she was a daughter and for the overthrow of which he had striven so fiercely had hoped by louis's declaration to fetter her independence of action the parlement anxious to assert its strength and hoping to find in the enemy of richelieu the enemy of richelieu's policy had now placed her by their own action in a position from which she was able before long to complete his work they were soon enlightened thoughtful men looked forward with dread to a policy of revenge the queen was advised to choose a counsellor committed to no faction and she chose to the surprise and disgust of richelieu's opponents his pupil and confidant mazarin a princess of spain guided by an italian adventurer of low birth was to complete the ruin of the spanish monarchy and the consolidation of the french people from first to last mazarin served the queen through every crisis with unfailing skill and she sustained him against all assaults with unswerving fidelity the fame of mazarin has suffered from the fact that he followed richelieu undoubtedly he will always occupy a lower place in the world's history than his great predecessor his character was not so heroic his personality so imposing his energy so fierce his conception so grandiose his grasp so comprehensive or his spirit so high where richelieu struck he bribed where richelieu defied he bent the knee the contrast at the outset of his career is thus described by the master hand of the cardinal de retz l'envoyé sur les degrés du trône du lapre et redoutable richelieu avait foudoyé plutôt que gouverner les humains en successeur doux et bénin qui ne voulait rien qui était au désespoir que sa dignité de cardinal ne lui permettait pas de se milier autant qu'il le souhaitait devant tout le monde non the less mazarin stands before us throughout his career as the one man of his time in france alone not merely in coolness and clear sight and good sense but in that which most distinguishes a man from the mass of men the distinct perception of a distant goal and an unfaltering determination to reach it if he had not the force of richelieu he was at least as supple and vigilant if he did not show himself so masterful of the present it was perhaps because he saw the future more clearly and fixed his eye too exclusively upon that his patience fertility of resource and tenacity of purpose were exhaustless brought up in the italian school of policy expediency was his only guide all lines of conduct were of merit in his eyes whatever moral verdict might be passed on them by others according as they tended even while apparently leading him far from the direct road to bring him in time nearer to his object he knew neither close friendships nor lasting hatreds for either of them might prove a hindrance to his progress and if in founding a great policy richelieu had to overcome colossal difficulties he had advantages which mazarin in his conflict to carry that policy to a triumphant conclusion conspicuously lacked richelieu was a frenchman of gentle birth and he was the irresponsible minister of a king in the plenitude of his power mazarin was a foreigner scarce able to speak the language of the country he aspired to rule and his task was while his mind was filled with far-off design to uphold without flinching sometimes in exile and in danger of his life at a period when every turbulent and selfish element of political life held riot the authority of an infant king 
at the outset of their career the hands of mazarin and the queen regent were strengthened by an opportune event on may nineteenth sixteen forty three the desperate valour of enghien and his horsemen swept away the renowned spanish infantry at rocroi by this feat of arms which marks the transference of military supremacy from the spanish to the french race a lustre was thrown upon the policy of richelieu which was of course reflected on the new government at the same time the support of the king's uncle the fickle and characterless orleans and of enguin's father conde were for the present secured for the court by liberal promises the first attack upon mazarin came not from either of the great interests which had been depressed but from a faction of persons who while without judgment or principle were active and unscrupulous enough to be dangerous the duke of beaufort grandson of henry the fourth and gabriel d'estrey whose only respectable quality was that of personal courage had collected around him his father vendome his insignificant brother mercure and a number of the less reputable noblesse who had not dared to raise their heads against richelieu with the most paltry designs they mingled the most high-sounding maxims and called themselves after the roman patriots whose deeds they professed to emulate the ridiculous side of the affair was soon recognized by the ready wit of the laughter-loving parisians it was the age of nicknames beaufort whose handsome figure and licentious life made him popular among the lower bourgeoisie was soon known as the roi des halles king of the market-place while his adherents were styled the importants with them were joined the returning exiles guise elbeuf epernon and others while the court ladies delighted at a new excitement and led by the famous duchesse of chevreuse and madame de montbazon threw themselves eagerly into the plot gallantry as was fitting caused the breaking up of the intrigue a quarrel for precedence between madame de montbazon and enguin's sister madame de longueville led to the disgrace of the former beaufort who was her lover determined to avenge her by the assassination of mazarin warned of the danger and recognizing the feebleness of the conspiracy mazarin at once struck his blow beaufort was arrested and imprisoned vendome the duchesse of chevreuse and the other leaders were exiled from paris and the party disappeared amid universal ridicule mazarin now felt strong enough to resist with steadiness the claims of the grandees elbeuf and epernon indeed received governments but bouillon was refused sedan and though vendome demanded the important government of brittany the queen took it into her own hands meanwhile the parlement was eagerly exercising its reasserted claim to interfere in state matters the aristocracy of the robe was a more dangerous enemy than that of the noblesse and a powerful means of attack was now furnished them it was no fault of mazarin that the finances of france were in a desperate condition the expenses of the war had been enormous and the constitutional machinery of taxation was not calculated for the strain at richelieu's death the revenue had been anticipated for three years supplies having been borrowed at exorbitant interest nor can the prodigality of the first year of the regency when the current phrase la reine est si bonne well expressed the incapacity of anne of austria to resist the importunity of the courtiers and when the indispensable support of orleans and conde could be secured only by enormous bribes be laid to his charge the state of things that had to be faced at present was that the expenditure which in sixteen forty two was ninety nine millions of livres had risen in sixteen forty four to one hundred and twenty four millions of which no less than fifty nine millions were absorbed by the rapacity of the courtiers and the farmers of the taxes but it was the manner in which these sums were raised more than the sums themselves which led to opposition the bankers who provided the loans had duties assigned to them in repayment which they themselves collected there was thus every opportunity for oppression and embezzlement the bankers grew enormously rich what however most roused the anger of the people was the knowledge that Emery, the controller general of finance a man of the vilest character was the worst trafficker in the spoil 
and that he was protected by Mazarin. The taille, a direct tax upon property which was levied almost entirely upon the peasantry, and which was peculiarly vexatious in its incidents, had at first been excluded from the bankers' operations. It now, however, fell into their hands and became a terrible burden. Provinces which had never seen an enemy were devastated as though a destroying army had passed over them, and popular revolts broke out in several quarters. Expedients still more desperate were resorted to. Twelve millions were borrowed at twenty-five per cent. Two hundred fresh offices were created for sale. A tax of joyeux avènement was levied upon all royal officers. The towns, communes, corporations, persons exempted from the tie, and innkeepers. Permanent duties to the crown were redeemed for cash grants of domain lands revoked dues for bequests rigidly exacted from the clergy and when all was done the greater part of the money thus raised was swallowed up in the repayment of loans emery now took the step which led to the first direct collision with the parlement charles i's abuse of the law of ship money may have suggested to him a similar abuse of the law called the toise by which in fifteen forty eight the building of houses outside the walls of Paris had for a special purpose been forbidden. In January 1644, a tax of 40 sous was laid on every toise of land thus built upon, and the government declined to allow appeals to be carried before the Parlement. Parlement at once declared this to be a violation of their privileges. The refusal of the court to give way was met by what came perilously near to an armed revolt, the mob threatened to burn down Emery's house. The more violent section of the Parlement openly avowed that a general rising was what they wished to bring about. The government recoiled before the danger. Some other method had to be found. The toise had fallen upon the poorer classes. Emery now proposed to raise the necessary supplies from the rich, and by the tax des aises, a kind of forced loan, he hoped to obtain eighteen or twenty millions. The Parlement willingly gave up the detested money-lenders to be spoiled, but they insisted on complete exemption for themselves and for all officials connected with them or with the university, as well as for merchants of only moderate wealth. These exceptions reduced the receipts to insignificance. Emery once more fell back in March 1645 upon the Toise, the riotous opposition of the younger members was at this time met with firmness by the court the deputation which was summoned by the queen to give an account of their conduct received a scolding as from our own queen elizabeth barillon one of the presidents and an adherent of the important was arrested and three other leading malcontents were exiled in this state of things mazarin looked anxiously abroad Again, Enguillon came to his aid by the victory of Nordlingen, August the 3rd, 1645. The prestige thus gained was at once turned to advantage. On September 5th, the boy king was brought to Paris to hold a lit de justice. From any decrees passed at this, the most solemn ceremony known to the Constitution, there was no escape short of civil war. For such an extremity, matters were not yet ripe and the parliament ceased open opposition the government wisely withdrew both the toise and the tax des aises but an immense number of new offices were created taxes on divers trades and many other expedients for raising money were registered the clergy the great trading companies and the officials of the sovereign courts were compelled to contribute largely for a year no further difficulty was experienced End of section three section four of the english restoration and louis the fourteenth by osmond airy this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter two prelude to the fronde part two number three the prince of conde Great as was the service which the successes of Enghien, now to be known as Condé, his father having died, had rendered the government, his position was the cause of much anxiety to Mazarin. 
whether for generalship or personal prowess he formed the most brilliant military figure of the time as a great cavalry leader he has had no equal marlborough was not more calm nor rupert more impetuous to him were given the face and figure that beseem the warrior the ringing voice to rally a squadron reeling from the charge the eagle eye which notes every desperate chance the instantaneous decision which compels the fate of battle he became the idol of the proud and warlike youth who had fought and conquered with him at rocroi and nordlingen and who emulating his cool carelessness in danger and his desperate valour in action formed the nucleus of that household brigade which earned for itself so terrible a fame throughout europe supreme as he was however in the battlefield conde's character was marred by unfortunate weaknesses he was foppish irritable intemperate in thought and language and inordinately vain his followers imitated the defects of their master and what was pardonable in the great soldier became absurd in them with their wonted readiness the parisians took hold of the poorer side of their character the supercilious airs the foppishness of dress and they have come down to us as the petit maître intoxicated with his well-earned glory and with the adulation of this band of worshippers influential alike by the enormous wealth and power which he had inherited and by his near relation to the throne conde now began to evince a dangerous ambition in this ambition he was firmly withstood by mazarin and the queen to allow one man to become so powerful was to throw up the game the check sank deep into conde's mind to the contempt of the noble for the bourgeois and of the warrior for the statesman was now added a feeling of active hostility which at no distant time was to bear fruit number four encroachments of the parlement this however was not the danger that was momentarily pressing upon the government the financial troubles were again urgent in addition to indirect taxation which raised no opposition from the people emery now put in action one of the edicts of sixteen forty five by which all possessors of lands held on an annual rental to the crown were ordered to redeem that rent by payment of a year's revenue the peculiar sting of this lay in the fact that while the rent had not been changed since the middle ages and was therefore practically nominal the revenue had continually increased the bourgeoisie were at once in arms against the rachat for three days the palais royal was besieged by a crowd of angry citizens the announcement that a lit de justice was to be held to bear down opposition intensified the excitement dangerous talk was heard the successful insurrection of mazaniello in naples was quoted during the night the firing of musketry was heard in the streets the bourgeois were trying their arms urged on by their necessities the government nevertheless were firm the lit de justice was held the operation of the rachat was indeed postponed but money was again raised by new creations especially of maitre de requete the young king and mazarin had to listen to some plain speaking for ten years sire said omer talon the president the country districts have been ruined the peasants compelled to lie upon straw their furniture sold for the payment of taxes and for ten years to minister to the luxury of paris millions of innocent folk are obliged to live upon rye and oat bread and their only protection is their poverty their souls and nothing else are their own and that is only because they cannot be sold the historian of the french revolution finds its direct cause in the state of misery to which the peasantry were reduced under the administrations of richelieu and mazarin over the creation of maitre de requete serious opposition again broke out the existing officials loudly denied the right to create new offices during the minority of the king belonging as they did to the haute bourgeoisie officially connected with the parlement and in some cases allied to the noblesse they were a dangerous body to attack the parlement gladly made their cause its own it now went a step further than hitherto in its encroachments it refused at first 
to vote the edicts registered at the lit de justice except that of the racha and some others which it allowed with modifications in the end however it shrank once more from open conflict none the less it continued its examination of the edicts sous le bon plaisir du roi the example told upon the provinces both in brittany and at toulouse there was open and violent resistance a last resource was now discovered by the ingenuity of Emery, the paulette so named after its originator paulet who lived in the reign of henry the fourth was an annual tax paid by all officials who had a right to the heredity of their offices once in every nine years it was subject to revision before renewal and sixteen forty eight was the year at which a fresh revision was due emery now in addition to ceasing all payments to the creditors of government for a year a device afterwards imitated by charles the second in the stop of the exchequer and of salaries to the inferior officials determined to demand as a condition of the renewal a fine of four years salary in the hope of avoiding the opposition of the parlement the fine was not to be levied upon that body but the bribe was refused on the contrary the parlement signed a bond of union may thirteenth sixteen forty eight with the other sovereign courts and decided to send deputies to a conference in the chamber of st louis the court immediately recognized the significance of such a step and determined to oppose the meeting with resolution it was not to be imagined that an assembly so formed would limit its actions to the single purpose for which it was ostensibly convened two leading deputies were arrested others were exiled from paris and threats of severer measures were thrown out suddenly at the moment when the court seemed in command of the situation events occurred which compelled mazarin to temporize orleans joined the malcontents beaufort the leader of the important had escaped from vincennes the provinces were stirring for revolt abroad too matters were going ill the spaniards had taken courtrai and were gaining ground fast a conference was therefore opened with the parlement at which mazarin made a striking representation of the danger of its action discord he said was giving to spain greater advantages than she could gain by force of arms the refusal of supplies would speedily make useless all the expenditure of blood and treasure already incurred catalonia must be abandoned the alliance with sweden and other powers to whom france gave subsidies must be broken off his words were vain personal and selfish interests were supreme mazarin saw that resistance at the moment was useless he succeeded in inducing the haughty queen to bend before the canaille as she called them in her anger to promise the release of the imprisoned members and the acceptance of the demands of the parlement parlement at once sent deputies to the chamber of st louis and thus at first in defiance of the queen and at length on june thirtieth sixteen forty eight with her consent was formed a body which became as was anticipated a permanent political assembly sitting during its own pleasure like our long parliament for the reform of the kingdom the aristocracy of the robe had won a definite victory over ministerial power five the english rebellion and the fronde between the five years barren turmoil of the fronde and the contemporary struggle of the english parliament with charles i there are points of superficial similarity sufficiently striking to suggest comparison in both cases the conflict arose from the ill-defined character of the prerogative in relation to the other powers of the state and in both the prime ministership the special characteristic of absolutism was in the first instance the object of attack in both the contending forces under the stress of war each summoned to its help foreign aid and in both the anti-absolutist party established in defiance of the constitution a permanent assembly the one in the chamber of st louis the other in the long parliament but here resemblance ceases the differences between the two movements were radical and profound how real was the one how purposeless in comparison was the other 
may be inferred from the fact that whereas the english movement reacted constantly upon the french the events of the fronde received not the slightest attention from even if they were known to those who in england were engaged in a conflict which absorbed every quality of heart and brain the english contest was at once accentuated and ennobled by religious and intellectual antagonism of the intensest character it was a contest of modes of thought an earnest faith in the righteousness of their cause an enthusiastic conviction in the direct interposition of god in their behalf sustained the noblest of charles's antagonists in every reverse and carried them forward to every victory and it is this which clothes the english rebellion with tragic dignity to the fronde this religious element was utterly wanting and so there was in it no trace of heroism for falkland eagerly welcoming the death which saved him from witnessing longer the agony of his country for hampton praying with his last breath for her relief for milton sanctifying rebellion by a divine eloquence it has absolutely no figures to show so too in face of the struggle of great principles which constituted the english rebellion family ties were unhesitatingly if mournfully sacrificed and gallantry and intrigue were powerless in the whole annals of the civil war scarcely a woman's name occurs but the pages of the fronde are crowded with the names of women beautiful clever and brave but licentious and unprincipled who swayed the fortunes of the fight at the caprice of their amour or the ambition of their families who had each of them her price and to gain whom occupied the constant attention of mazarin and his opponents alike we look in vain to the leaders of the fronde for self-sacrifice or the idea of duty for far-reaching sight or for controlling force we look in vain for an elliot a pym or a cromwell we find instead de retz whose highest ambition was to be the leader of a faction and whose strongest motive was personal hatred of mazarin who despising his dupes merely amused himself with revolt we find beaufort vain silly and petulant the darling of shopkeepers wives Condé, leading more than once the hereditary enemies of his country against his king with no higher object than the satisfaction of his vanity or leon slothful timid and blown about with every varying wind of fortune beside them there flash across the stage with all the picturesque garb and incident of the time many gay and gallant figures as brilliant in their contrast with the sombre men of the english revolution as the causes for which they contested were light and fleeting in comparison with the stern purposes of that great fight the contrast is expressed in the names a fronde was a sling used by boys in their play the english movement was indeed a revolution the french movement was but a mischievous burlesque of a revolution and as such it is fitly known by a name derived from the sport of gamin and schoolboys to these the profoundest of the differences which forbid comparison there are others little less striking to be added the english parliament represented freely and directly the whole english people the parlement of paris was a body of permanent officials who though they had acquired considerable power possessed constitutionally no legislative or even deliberative functions represented no interests but their own and discovered in every action the inveterate selfishness of a narrow and grasping caste in england the intimate connection between all the members of the social body the sympathy the comradeship indeed between nobles and commoners governed and governing classes made cooperation not merely feasible but natural and enabled the whole nation from highest to lowest to take in the struggle an eager and constant part in france the baneful division of classes long existing and sedulously encouraged by richelieu was fatal to all such common action the bourgeoisie had no support in an impoverished and despairing peasantry and though for a time officialism might enlist the scornful support of an idle and arrogant noblesse the unnatural alliance gave way as soon as a common danger was removed 
the english movement was national the french was personal one more difference of far-reaching import must be noticed old and venerable as was the idea of monarchy in england its place in the english mind was disputed and in many cases occupied by the representative idea which had grown up with it side by side and so it happened that though destroying forever all hope for royal absolutism the english revolution was eminently constructive the parliament saw more clearly than the king what they wanted and this they were able to obtain without a king the machinery of government was ready to their hand the destruction of monarchy as a temporary measure was therefore possible without national disintegration very different was it in france even previous to the ministry of richelieu the idea of the sacredness of monarchy had been all-pervading and he had striven to raise it to the rank of a religion it had absorbed into itself all other ideas of government and it never entered into any frenchman's head that monarchy could be dispensed with for a day and thus the french movement was eminently destructive it is impossible to see even now what could have taken the place of the french absolutism except disastrous and illimitable confusion had either officialism or grandeeism triumphed it was the sense of this that led to the final failure of the fronde how different were the issues in the two countries may be judged from the party cries in england the royalists cried god and the king his opponent answered with god and the parliament in france even while the king was a child there were but two serious variations upon vive le roi they were vive le roi et les princes and à bas le mazarin End of section four. Section five of the English Restoration and Louis the Fourteenth by Osmond Airy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter three. The Parliamentary Fronde. Part one. Number one. Concessions of the Court the first or parliamentary period of the fronde possessed a certain title to respect amid the mob of interested officials turbulent nobles intriguing priests and clamorous bourgeois were to be found men who represented the highest type of citizen life whom neither anne of austria nor the mob of paris could terrify nor mazarin cajole and though violence folly selfishness and confusion marked its course and though all zeal for the welfare of the country was soon forgotten in the indulgence of an unreasoning hate of mazarin this movement had nevertheless the merit of attacking however interestedly and however inopportunely a taxation that had become ruinous and an administration of reckless waste for a while mazarin appears not to have recognized the gravity of the situation he was ignorant in a great degree of the constitution of the country and it was the intrigues in the court which appeared important to him and now at the very moment when the chamber of st louis had established its position as an imperium in imperio of the most threatening character he was occupied with the endeavours of the duke of longueville who had married the sister of cond to acquire the right to sit among the princes of the blood he was however soon awakened the thirty-two delegates were already busy in claiming the control of every branch of the administration with a just instinct they first fell upon the intendants by whose appointment richelieu had dealt so severe a blow to vested interests and local privileges they demanded the dismissal of these officers and the transference of their duties to the three thousand petty officials whom they had superseded they then asked for the remission of a quarter of the tie and of all arrears since sixteen forty seven the annulling of all contracts with the financiers regarding it and the strict appropriation of the supplies gained from it to the purposes of the war a chamber of justice was to be created to investigate the extortions of the farmers of the taxes 
the proposal that no tax should in future be levied unless previously voted by the parliament was doubtless prompted by the action of the long parliament in england as was also the claim that no one should be detained in prison for more than twenty-four hours without being brought to trial before his proper judges the trading classes demanded the abolition of all monopolies and abuses in the sale of necessaries and the protection of native industries no new offices were to be created without the consent of parliament and there should be no diminution of salaries all these demands of the chamber which were endorsed and presented by the parliament were in direct denial of the doctrine that to the crown alone belonged all legislative authority furious at the arrogance of the canaille anne of austria for a time refused to listen to these demands but mazarin now fully alive to the danger and especially to the precariousness of his own personal position induced her to temporize a Mary was dismissed the intendancies all but three were revoked a diminution of one-eighth of the tie was offered and the desired chamber of justice was decreed the late appointments which had caused so much jealousy were revoked the diminished salaries restored to the original sums and the paulette renewed the right of the parliament to verify financial edicts was acknowledged the queen in her own phrase threw roses at the parliament in return for these concessions the court demanded that the chamber of st louis should be dissolved and that the parliament should return to its purely judicial functions which had lately been much neglected the frondeur in reply pointed out the omission of any satisfactory mention of the point upon which they felt most strongly arbitrary arrest and they urged the summoning by the crown of a general assembly composed of the different chambers again mazarin had great difficulty in calming the queen who as he told her was valiant as a soldier who does not recognize danger and who was for immediate conflict he himself was looking eagerly abroad and was waiting only until his hands should be again strengthened by a striking military success number two beginning of revolution in the end of august great news arrived on the twentieth conde gained the victory of lens which well nigh completed the ruin of the spanish military strength the opportunity was instantly seized while the te deum was being chanted for the victory broussel and blancmesnil two of the councillors who had been foremost in opposing the court were arrested by the queen's orders within an hour the people sedulously nursed for sedition by mazarin's opponents were in uproar they thronged the city threw up barricades and let down the chains which barred the narrow streets in an incredibly short time paris was an impassable camp and the whole city was in arms and now while the cry of vive le roi was shouted as loudly as ever was heard with it the watchword of the next five years point de mazarin number three the cardinal de retz during all the troubles that had now opened upon france no influence was more actively exerted for mischief than that of jean francois paul de gondi better known by his later title of cardinal de retz of italian birth he had risen by the favour of richelieu and by his own talents and craft until having taken orders he became after a youth of dissipation coadjutor to his uncle the aged archbishop of paris a duellist and a libertine with no spark of religious feeling and hating his profession he looked to it nevertheless to secure for him an eminent place in the turmoil of politics to increase the importance of his office he asserted and maintained his right of precedence even over the duke of orleans and insisted upon the fullest recognition of his ecclesiastical rank by the careful performance of all the outward duties of his place by a well-feigned humility by profuse almsgiving and by an ostentatious attention to the interests of the poor he secured among them a dangerous influence diminutive in stature and with signal disadvantages of person he possessed a charm of tongue with which it was as easy for him to sway the passions of the mob or the councils of the parliaments as to seduce women or entice men into conspiracy 
conspiracy indeed was the aim of his existence he is the unique example of a man of great and powerful mind deliberately setting before himself as the highest attainable object the position of a successful faction leader such a title he declared was the most honourable that he could find in plutarch's lives at the age of eighteen he had written a history of the conspiracy of jean louis de fiesque in which are laid down all the rules of successful treason higher qualities were he declared needed to form a successful faction leader than to form a great emperor of the universe and catiline was a greater man than caesar for the career of his adoption he was admirably suited by the endowments of his italian birth he had the supple resoluteness the ready resource and the absolute unscrupulousness of his countrymen he was free from all personal ties other than that of a licentious but calculating attachment to one or two of the women whose names are notorious among the female leaders of the fronde of statesmanship he possessed no trace and the cause for which he fought so long as it was the cause of confusion was a matter of indifference to him his action was at present decided by an intense jealousy of mazarin and by the perception that in opposition to him could be found the fullest opportunity for the exercise of his powers but he valued good taste in treason as he valued it in art his natural feeling for the fitting in time and place had made him keep aloof from the important for whom as for many of his later associates he professed a hearty contempt now however he considered his time had come arrayed in his ecclesiastical vestments he went to the palais royal and urged upon the queen the release of bruxelles rather would i strangle him with my own hands was the passionate reply the royal guards were ordered out to disperse the crowd but they were stopped by the first barricades de retz accompanied them and endeavoured he says to soothe the tumult on his return to the court he was received by anne with bitter sarcasm vous avez bien travaillé monsieur allez vous reposer the insult sank deep and henceforth he pursued a course of bitter enmity to the queen and mazarin for two days the mob remained under arms loss of life took place and the royal officers were insulted and attacked the parlement passed in a body through the seething streets to demand the release of the prisoners twice they were repelled with anger by anne on their third visit the president to molay informed the queen that if she did not give way he would not answer longer for the consequences at the entreaties of mazarin and orleans she at length consented to a compromise the parlement gave up its pretensions to interfere in state administration with some minor exceptions and in return bruxelles was set at liberty his entry on august twenty eighth was one long triumphal procession the people in a delirium of joy at their victory flung themselves at his feet and addressed him as their saviour and protector having offered his thanks at notre dame he was escorted to the grand chamber and there received the congratulations of the parlement the frenzy fit which had seized the people then passed off with the picturesque rapidity which had marked its beginning within a few hours the barricades had disappeared the mob had melted away and paris was in absolute repose it was as if a troubling dream had come suddenly to an end number four mazarin's measures the court leaves paris but mazarin was not deceived he foresaw further attacks and he resolved to be beforehand with his opponents on the very day after the return to bruxelles he drew up for the queen notes of the course of action to be pursued an agreement with de retz and the other leaders of the opposition must be ostentatiously concluded the court must then leave paris suspicion must be lulled until conde's return and a blow must then be struck which should at once restore the royal authority in the meantime the malcontents were to be divided by all possible means circumstances were favourable to this design to the whole trading class these troubles meant confusion and loss already the guilds had met the principal shopkeepers and had determined to meddle in nothing against the king's service the queen took pains to gain over the provost of the merchants 
the commander of the city militia and the captains of the quarters mazarin himself treated directly with many members of the parlement and was so successful that even broussel and blancmesnil appeared at court this however served only to exasperate the younger members acting under the instigation of de retz they met privately and determined to attack mazarin personally by agitating for the revival of the edict of sixteen seventeen which proscribed all foreigners who interfered in the government of france mazarin now carried out his plan at six in the morning of september thirteenth the court left paris for rouel ten miles distant where it was joined by orleans cond and the duke of longueville this was followed by the dismissal of chateauneuf and the arrest of chavigny old rivals of mazarin who were caballing with the disaffected members of the parlement far from intimidating this blow served only to irritate that jealous body a deputation was sent to the queen to demand the release of chavigny the return of the court and the presence of the princes of the blood at the deliberations of the parlement these demands were angrily rejected cond especially distinguished himself by the violence of his language the decrees of the parlement were annulled by the council and it was half decided to supplant that body by royal commissions the parlement on its side prepared for defensive war all business was discontinued the city was secured against a surprise and provisions were laid in for the expected siege number five mazarin and cond everything in this contest is spasmodic except the will and the design of mazarin the uncertain temper of cond to whom all men looked as possessing the power of the sword had especially to be reckoned with it was well known that much as he despised the frondeur his hatred of mazarin was a still more powerful feeling he had hitherto passionately refused to join in harassing the crown but now de retz had little difficulty in persuading him to consent to a conference at which his jealousy of the cardinal should be gratified by the latter's exclusion mazarin did not care to contest the point whether the hatred against him was genuine may be doubted but there is no doubt as to the vehemence of its expression at this time no story of his crimes was too wild for credit he was a robber a traitor a gambler a usurer an atheist and a debauchee to sack and burn paris to ruin france for his own greed and to keep her at war with foreign nations that he might the better maintain himself in his usurped authority were represented to be the objects of his life the conference lasted ten days it resulted in the declaration of october twenty second sixteen forty eight in which the greater number of the claims made by the chamber of st louis were conceded but the root idea of the constitution that in the king's presence nothing could be refused or combated which he personally announced was preserved in the retention of the power to hold lit de justice while as to arbitrary arrests a verbal promise never intended to be kept was all that could be wrung from anne if i consent to such requests said the queen my son would be no better than the king of a pack of cards mazarin now devoted himself to again fixing the fickle humour of cond the task was not an easy one but the prince could not yet forget that he was of royal blood and he had the true caste contempt for the jean de chicaine of the parlement who pretended to tutor the king of france his own interests moreover had not yet been awakened against the court mazarin ever watchful and patient was therefore before long successful cond yielded to the flatteries of the queen and to the assurances of the cardinal that the government should be conducted solely by his advice in december the compact was closed by the cession to cond of the governments of stenay and four other important places bribery on a similar scale was equally successful with orleans End of section five section six of the english restoration and louis the fourteenth by osmond airy this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter three 
the parliamentary fronde part two number six the court leaves paris a second time beginning of civil war the court had meanwhile at the desire of the merchants returned to paris but the atmosphere was no less charged with trouble than before disappointed at the non-fulfilment of the declaration of october twenty second the parlement was again in uproar de retz fully in his element stirred up the flame of sedition to the utmost he found assistance from the authors of the innumerable pamphlets known as mazarinade libelous writings against the cardinal and the queen which without pretensions of literary merit tickled the ears of the parisians with their mendacious and brutal allusions mazarin pointed out to the queen that the revolution in england had been preceded by a similar phenomenon and bade her remember that when in order to stop such writings charles i had sacrificed strafford he had but begun his own downfall by encouraging the parliament to cry for further concessions secure for the time in the support of cond and orleans the court now determined upon force mazarin had long planned to retire to st germain occupy the strategic points and prevent the entrance of provisions into paris at three in the morning of january fifth sixteen forty nine the queen left the palais royal a second time in haste and secrecy at st germain she was joined by mazarin the princes and the court paris on its awakening heard with stupor and affright of the departure the citizens saw war siege and famine at their gates undismayed however the parlement met all available measures of defence were taken provisions were hastily collected the gates were shut and guarded the civil war had begun number seven the twelve weeks war mazarin had been quietly preparing for this decisive action by collecting troops in the neighbourhood of paris and although they were yet too few to form any real blockade he was able so far to hinder the entry of supplies that serious inconvenience was soon felt the shopkeepers with a considerable body within the parlement were anxious to come to terms but the earnest opponents of absolutism with the discontented noblesse and the lower classes were bent upon resistance de retz was ceaselessly active and under his influence the mob was soon in a state of wild excitement the houses of known adherents of the court were pillaged and any who attempted to escape to ruel ran serious risk of their lives an army of twelve thousand men was raised de retz furnishing a regiment of cavalry at his own expense and a heavy war tax was voted for their payment a royal edict ordering the parlement to retire to montargis was met by a vote to demand the immediate dismissal and banishment of mazarin the frondeur had indeed raised an army but it was one that could not be trusted to meet the regular troops and it was without leaders who could be opposed to cond the general du mazarin as he was now called the want was partially supplied by the arrival of the duke of elbeuf an old opponent of richelieu he was at once named commander-in-chief his dignity however was short-lived the divisions within the cond family and the jealousy of mazarin were skilfully made use of by de retz and the prince's sister the duchess of longueville they sent secretly to st germain to offer the post to conti conde's brother a youth both physically and mentally infirm and on the night of january seventh conti longueville marciac and la motte Houdecourt deserted the court they were soon joined by beaufort and by bouillon the brother of turenne danger threatened from two other quarters turenne the general of greatest repute in france after conde and greatly conde's superior in tactical skill was on the frontier with a large body of troops partly french and partly alsatian mercenaries whom he was endeavouring to induce to follow him against the royal forces normandy where the longueville family was powerful was preparing for revolt the dangers however were well and coolly met normandy rose but the duke of longueville who had been sent thither by his wife 
was completely kept in check by Arcourt for the king, and when Turenne had resolved to march to Paris, he found that before he could do so, he should have to fight his own troops. The mercenaries had been made safe by the distribution of three hundred thousand livres. Never had Mazarin applied money to better purpose. Turenne at once retired to Heilbronn and thence to Holland until the end of the Twelve Weeks' War. Meantime, within Paris, the insurrection was in full swing. The Bastille and the Arsenal had been taken by the Frondeurs, while the surprise of Charenton at the junction of the Marne and Seine secured for a time a free entry for provisions. But here the successes of the Frondeurs ceased. An attempt by Beaufort to take Corbeil was ignominiously defeated. More than one sortie was driven back, and Charenton was recaptured by Condé on February 8th. A natural reaction, headed by the clergy, began to declare itself. For a time, the violent section fought hard to keep the upper hand. An emissary of the court who was found distributing loyal literature was closely imprisoned. A herald from the king to the parlement was refused admittance on the curious ground that heralds could pass only between enemies and equals, and that to receive him would be to admit that the parlement was the enemy and the equal of the king. Still the credit of the irreconcilables was daily growing less, the process of disintegration being aided by the vexatious nature of the devices for raising money. To provide a fresh stimulus for this flagging spirit, de Retz now began to intrigue directly with Spain. The Spaniards were ready enough to meet these advances, for they were anxious to avenge their defeats in the field at Roqua and Lens, and their discomfiture in diplomacy by the Treaty of Westphalia. On February 19th, Conti informed the Parlement that an envoy of the Archduke Leopold, the governor of the Low Countries, prayed for audience. This envoy was a monk, sent indeed by the Archduke, but whose address to the Parlement was actually prepared for him by de Retz. His admission, however, caused forcible protests from the moderate party. Can it be, exclaimed the President de Mesma, that a prince of the blood proposes to grant, amid the fleur de lis, an audience to the representative of the bitterest enemy of the fleur de lis? Further checks and skirmishes with the royal troops led to bickering among generals who were rebels from selfishness alone, while the inconvenience and positive distress which was now beginning to be felt were doing their natural work. An event, moreover, had occurred abroad which had remarkable effect. The execution of Charles I in England, so far from encouraging the Frondeurs, shocked the conscience of a people who, whatever else they might be fighting against, had no thought of fighting against monarchy, while the presence of Henrietta Maria in Paris, in need so great that she owed to de Retz the provision of a fire in the bitter winter weather, served to heighten the effect. Moreover, the news of Longueville's fiasco in Normandy and of Turenne's flight to Holland had by this time reached the harassed and disheartened city. Tired of rebellion, which was not successful, of exactions from which no results were forthcoming, and of leaders who showed no capacity for leadership, the Parlement, on February 28th, decided to send deputies to treat with the court, though forbidden to hold communication with Mazarin. It was characteristic of Mazarin that he never at any time took public notice of personal slights. He was perfectly willing now to humour the more violent members of the Parlement when they refused to treat with him in person. An arrangement was made by which the parties to the conference met on March 4th in separate rooms and communicated with each other only through their secretaries. The following conditions were agreed to. The Parlement was to show its obedience by coming to Saint-Germain to attend a lit de justice. It was to hold no assembly without the royal permission during 1649. All its arrêts, passed since January 6th, were to be annulled, including those against the Cardinal, as also those by the Council against the Parlement. The troops in Paris were to be disbanded, and the inhabitants were to lay down their arms. The Bastille and Arsenal were to be given back to the king, and a second envoy who had come from the Archduke was to be at once dismissed. On the other hand, 
the king was to set all prisoners at liberty to grant a general amnesty and to return to paris as soon as his affairs would allow the declarations of july and october were to be confirmed the claims of the parlement of rouen and aix were to receive a favourable treatment and finally the right of the parlement to take part in state affairs was at length to be admitted by the appointment of a member of the parlement to assist in the negotiations with spain nothing but necessity would have wrung this from mazarin he knew however that turenne had again offered an army to the insurgents that the archduke was about to invade france and that if he did so the siege of paris would have to be raised for a moment it seemed as if even now the concessions were to no purpose the energy of de retz still kept up the violence of the extremists the signature of mazarin to the treaty made them furious they inveighed against the weak compliance of their representatives they demanded that the treaty should be burnt language borrowed from england was for the first time heard the kings made the parliaments it is true but the people made the kings the cry for a republic was actually raised once more it appeared prudent to give way leopold was already on french soil his vanguard had reached pont de Vere on the Aisne. the court receded so far as to relinquish the lit de justice and the interdiction of the assemblies should this concession not satisfy the frondeurs it was determined to attack paris with all possible force while the weimarian general erlach with the mercenaries in the pay of the court faced the archduke meanwhile every effort was made to detach the generals of the fronde from the parlement it was a mere question of money with the single exception of de retz they handed in the personal demands upon the concession of which they offered to come over to the court rochefoucauld demanded the taberet for his wife and for himself eighteen thousand livres conti claimed a position in the council and the government of some strong place longueville wanted an important government in normandy with reversion to his children elbeuf asked for the payment of large sums which he claimed to be due to him and his wife beaufort demanded brittany for his father vendome and money for himself boulon asked for himself a vast sum of money as compensation for the loss of sedan and for turenne the government of alsace and philipsburg houdincourt required seven hundred thousand livres their greed was satisfied sufficiently to win them for the time mazarin steadfastly refused to grant away provinces or strong places and they like true hagglers took what they could get in money and in promises on april first all coherence of resistance being thus at an end the parlement met under a strong guard for fear of the mob and ratified the peace it was obvious however that an arrangement which had been brought about by necessity on either side and by which neither party had gained its objects was destined to be but a truce the discontent with mazarin remained as it was the nobles were neither contented nor intimidated and the government felt that it had succeeded in obtaining a virtual victory less by its own strength than by the weakness of its enemies had the provinces to any considerable extent espoused the cause of the fronde mazarin could scarcely have escaped complete discomfiture but brittany the most important had remained thoroughly loyal champagne and poitou though excited were easily kept in submission and the revolt in normandy had no popular basis in aix in provence the frondeurs had taken up arms by wise conciliation however mazarin had secured their submission without bloodshed and had induced the parlement of aix by some increase of its privileges to annul all the acts passed during the late troubles the really serious outbreak was in guienne where a feud was raging between epernon the governor and the parlement of bordeaux the result was disastrous to the bordelais on may sixteenth the rebels were defeated in a battle which soon became a massacre in which three thousand men were slaughtered mazarin seized the opportunity to endeavour to re-establish the intendants in the provinces foiled in this he partially gained the end in another way by choosing commissioners from the parliamentary families 
and by thus associating the parlement itself with the reorganization of the provincial administration during the daily complications of this struggle mazarin had with unwavering firmness been conducting the negotiations for peace with spain firmness indeed was needed for spain relying upon his difficulties had been endeavouring to impose hard conditions it is significant of his confidence in the momentary character of those difficulties that from the treaty of westphalia he steadfastly refused the slightest concessions even now though the spaniards were on french soil and though ypres and st venon had both fallen into their hands his only thought was to win some brilliant success in the field which like the victories of rocroi and lens should smooth the path at home Arcourt, therefore the ablest of the royal officers after cond was sent to besiege cambrai while in order to be near the seat of war the court took up its quarters at amiens the spaniards however were able to throw reinforcements into the place and the siege had to be raised the check was brilliantly redeemed by the capture of the fortress of cond commanding the junction of the Aisne and the scheldt and although this place had in turn to be abandoned the great point had been gained of proving that france was still in a state of elastic vigour mazarin meanwhile continued his dealings with the leaders of the fronde his first step was significant of the character of the time through the agency of one of her lovers he secured the duchess of chevreuse the chief instigator of the plots with spain and through her he gained over in turn the support of many of his most dangerous opponents two important exceptions however occurred to his conquests beaufort declined all bribes he preferred to remain the roi des alles de retz though he attended the court steadfastly refused to see mazarin at length on august eighteenth sixteen forty nine it was thought safe for the court to return the king's cortege was accompanied through the streets with enthusiastic cries of welcome even the hatred against mazarin always probably more fictitious than real appeared to have vanished and he was everywhere received with respect the parliamentary fronde was at an end and to all appearances the danger and confusion were past as a matter of fact a storm to which the last had been child's play was about to break upon Mazarin. End of section 6